Thank you so all, and I'd like to thank Professor Muchnik and the other organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure. What's this quick time? I don't need this. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm going to try to offer a little bit of uh, unconventional view on uh, some of the basics of uh, neural networks. Um, we are kind of reviving neural nets from the 90s, and uh, it's a good idea to remember what was there. And uh, part of it will be done with uh, the help of uh, non-conventional uh, colleagues, uh, which are uh, these animals, uh, including the conductor. Each of these animals is performing computation far better than what we can do uh, and uh, what uh, our uh, machine learning or signal processing can do. So it makes uh, sense to try and understand what it is that they are doing. I'll try to... Uh, uh, put uh, uh, an emphasis on the representation to kind of say that it's all about a sophisticated representation which makes the calculation uh, be very simple. And uh, let's start and uh, get into it. And for me, it basically starts from Jeff Hinton in uh, 87. Uh, so that was a paper where he already described several methods uh, for training neural networks and uh, started talking about uh, ways to impose uh, interesting structure into uh, neural networks. Uh, he then uh, took it to, again, the same time, he took it to the uh, second paper. So both these papers really talk about, one, autoencoding, and two, uh, training for some kind of invariance. Okay? And uh, that was intriguing uh, until uh, a few years later, um, I realized that uh, this idea of putting bias into uh, hidden uh, units, into the weights of hidden units, uh, can be taken into very many directions. So just uh, two years before that, uh, I discovered a certain uh, unsupervised learning rule uh, that had to do with uh, synaptic modification that was really neuroscience kind of analysis where I did a mathematical analysis and showed that a certain uh, rule of uh, synaptic modification actually performs what is called uh, in statistics exploratory projection pursuit or search for projections where the distribution of these projections is far from Gaussian. And I actually defined a specific uh, uh, way of being far from Gaussian, and that had to be having kind of a dip at the center of the Gaussian, where the center mass of a Gaussian is. So there was a dip there, basically dividing it into two Gaussians or more. And then I wanted to take that into uh, backpropagation, and I introduced this uh, idea of having uh, the uh, weight uh, in the hidden layer uh, be changed by a gradient descent of a combination, not just, uh, uh, of course, uh, the minimization of the error and not just regularization, L2, L1, weight decay, etc., but also imposing actual real structure in there and imposing, for example, this idea of what's called multimodality or exploratory projection uh, pursuit. At that time, uh, Gluck. Uh, presented at uh, uh, NIPS uh, a very interesting model of uh, hippocampus. And uh, that model uh, was the following. It had uh, the autoencoder, the same autoencoder uh, that we talked about. However, it had something else, and that was an autoencoder and an additional uh, output unit that are trying to learn some uh, structure in the data or basically perform classification. That uh, intrigued me uh, very much. And uh, I took it into uh, face recognition. I was doing then face recognition, like uh, a lot of researchers. And uh, I uh, realized that the face recognition, where you take beautiful pictures at a very nice background, uh, when everything is clean and uh, nice, uh, is one thing, but real face recognition requires people to move around, to have some blur. Uh, 
in between them and uh, the person watching them, etc., etc. So I wanted to do the following: uh, take um, a backpropagation network that uh, was trying to uh, learn faces and do two tasks at the same time: autoencoding, namely try to reconstruct uh, the original uh, face, and at the same time, of course, try to classify. So again, imposing representation into the hidden units uh, that was much more uh, informative uh, for the classification because by that time it was easy to show that uh, some of the data uh, of experiments that were done were actually discovering the background of the faces, some were just concentrating on the hairstyle, basically not concentrating, concentrating on every feature that could be uh, in the picture, and we wanted to uh, improve on that. So that was some improvement, uh, but what came next uh, was much more interesting. Uh, we realized that we can actually synthesize, in using the words uh, that Lior mentioned uh, yesterday, synthesize data out of the same data. And what we did is we started degrading the images, degrading the images, training this network with the degraded images, forcing the network to try and reconstruct the original images and at the same time do the classification. Okay? And the degradation uh, became uh, intense, so uh, we did all sorts of blurring uh, uh, mechanisms, and uh, by this I mean Gaussian blur, out of focus uh, blur, uh, blind deconvolution, uh, adding noise and every uh, other uh, uh, aspect of degradation of the image that you can think of. And then, because we were training the network to reconstruct the original images, uh, what we created was some kind of uh, weights, convolutional weights in the hidden unit that were orthogonal or re relatively independent on uh, this degradation process. Okay? So the performance in classification of such degraded images was uh, much, much better. Could we do some more with this? Absolutely, yes. Uh, so uh, we realized that actually we can do some kind of recurrency. So we could take a degraded image, we could uh, run it through the network, take the output, take it again into the network, and usually uh, in about two or three iterations, we got even better classification result. So again, I'm, I, I, although I was training to reconstruct the original image, the real idea was to do the classification. And it was motivated by the fact that when we uh, classify someone that is partially occluded or, or blurred, etc., we don't try to reconstruct, we just try to classify. And the partial occlusion did also work. Okay, so uh, we uh, were able to show that this uh, idea uh, produced uh, performance in partial occlusion uh, as well. So again, the whole idea of uh, the autoencoder was to improve the internal representation for uh, these various uh, tasks. Let me shift gears and uh, move to something else and talk about ensemble averaging. Ensemble averaging was very common uh, for quite a while and was very successful and uh, kind of people stopped talking about it and I hope uh, to persuade you that it's uh, really, really crucial, okay? So the two questions when you do ensemble averaging is how to uh, actually train uh, uh, each of these experts when we know that we are going to use ensemble average. Are we just going to train each expert to be uh, an optimal expert by itself or are we going to take into account the fact, uh, the fact that uh, it's going to be in an ensemble? And the second one is, uh, what happens, and this is the practical question, what happens when we take the wrong model uh, to model specific data? And as I mentioned yesterday, when we are in a high dimensional space, we cannot see anything there, we cannot really know, so we are very likely to start uh, with uh, something like this. Let me uh, uh, give just two slides of some equations, something very, very simple. Uh, it all uh, has to do with the variance bias decomposition, but not of a single expert, but of an ensemble, ensemble of uh, experts. So it's really 
starting, I define uh, the ensemble to be the simple average uh, of the experts. I plug that in here and then uh, I uh, get uh, uh, these uh, two equations uh, for each one of the parts. And when I plug this back, uh, I get the following. Uh, if I defined this gamma to be the variance of f plus q minus 1, the maximum uh, of this variance, okay, or the maximum of the variance uh, error of each of the experts, then I get to this uh, very interesting bound saying that the variance of the ensemble is uh, smaller than uh <coughs> this uh, 1 over q times gamma, where gamma basically uh, indicates the variance of each uh, of the experts as taken into account when trained in this condition. So in the best scenario, it would be 1 over q, uh, the variance of each one, and in the worst scenario, it will be the variance uh, of the original uh, and, uh, members of the ensemble. Okay? So with uh, this in mind, uh, Notice that there's a very, very simple bound here. The question is, is it really useful? Is it really practical? Uh, and I'm going to uh, demonstrate it on uh, a problem that has been studied quite a bit, um, highly nonlinear. This is this two spiral problem. Okay. Uh, there were uh, many papers written indicating that backpropagation cannot solve this problem. And it makes a lot of sense. So let me explain what the problem is. Uh, for those who cannot see, there are uh, x's here and zeros. So the task is to separate between uh, the x's and the zeros, or to create the nonlinear uh, boundary uh, separating between them. Okay? Uh, because the radius is changing, then this becomes a highly nonlinear uh, case, uh, both in uh, r theta, uh, uh, in r theta and in, of course, uh, the Euclidean space uh, as well. And uh, the question was how to do it. And this is a very non-trivial uh, uh, way to do it. Uh, and the student that uh, worked on that uh, was frustrated for a long time and was asking me, is it really going to work? Is it really going to work? Because it didn't make sense. So what did I do here? I injected noise. I actually, well, I, I mean, the data set was I think 192 um, uh, patterns from this, so you couldn't really learn the whole uh, the whole uh, uh, surface. You just had few examples uh, there, and the idea was to increase again, synthesize more data, but in this case, synthesize more data by adding a lot of noise, a lot of noise to the point where actually x's and zeros cross boundaries. So I was actually training on kind of the wrong labels uh, by doing that. And the question is, could it uh, do something useful? So it makes sense what I'm like, non-trivial, but crazy. Uh, so look at uh, the earth surface that uh, was uh, with another student. Uh, look at what happens uh, at the earth surface when you uh, train. So this is time. And uh, these, each one of them represents uh, a, a larger and larger ensemble. So the top one is q equals 1, q equals 2, 4, etc. And there are two, uh, two experts here, or two uh, kind of uh, uh, architectures here. Uh, this first architecture, uh, for q equals 1, the error is much smaller than this first architecture for q equals 1. So if I was training just a single expert, I would kind of choose this architecture, okay? If you uh, notice carefully, uh, the uh, minima uh, is shifted because when we ensemble, we actually reduce the variance portion of the error. We don't touch the bias portion of the error. And so uh, since the optimal is when the, bias, the variance and the bias are uh, equal, then uh, it is shifted to a point where the variance of a single expert would be much higher, but the variance of the ensemble is uh, low. And uh, what's interesting is that if you take uh, the minimum point of each uh, of these uh, experts uh, and you put them uh, on a graph, you actually get this uh, straight line, uh, just like uh, the equation from the previous slide uh, 
predicted. And as I mentioned before, this one starts with a very high error. So you see uh, the error here. So this is uh, one. Uh, this axis is one over Q. So one is here, and as Q goes uh, becomes high, then we move close to zero. And what we see is that uh, the slope uh, is really what matters. And when the slope of this architecture is uh, bigger, then eventually it will cross and it will actually uh, produce better result. Okay, non-trivial, <coughs> and apparently you don't have to train a lot of networks in order to say that, because you can just take the first two points and draw the uh, line and determine which one is going to be better. So let's take this into uh, the problem that I was talking about. Uh, this uh, spiral uh, problem. What's nice about this problem, it's two-dimensional. You can really see uh, there's this error surface very, very clearly. So it's kind of nice to demonstrate what's going on. And what we see here is from left to right going uh, this way, um, the result of an ensemble, in this case, of five networks, okay, large networks, five large networks, uh, when we increase the level of the noise. As I mentioned before, that noise, I, I put one slide of the noise, that would turn out to be the optimal noise. So we see that when we increase the level of the noise, we do get to some areas where <coughs> uh, the ensemble appears to be slightly better. Of course, regularization should be added. So here uh, we see the same graph with regularization, we see slightly more uh, smooth uh, result. And when we take this uh, to 40, uh, uh, ensemble of 40 members, uh, we actually recover very nicely uh, the error surface. So what we have here is uh, an ensemble with no uh, uh, noise injection, noise injection with no regularization, regularization with no noise injection and regularization and noise injection together. Okay, so what did we do? We uh, increased the uh, noisiness or the variance of each of the experts by injecting this noise, but we gained something. And the something that we gained is the independence between the errors, the independence between the errors uh, of each of these experts an independence that then reduced the performance, uh, sorry, improved the performance or reduced the error of uh, the ensemble. Okay, so the question is, are we the only ones doing that? The answer is no. And uh, we are now shifting to uh, a little bit to animals and soon we're gonna shift into a more uh, serious uh, signal processing. So this little animal, the sonar bed, there are about 800 species of this animal using sonar to catch its prey. And uh, it has, it's using about two mealworms a day as an energy uh, for energy. Uh, it has less uh, neurons than the number of transistors in a Pentium. And uh, the amount of computation uh, that it does in real time, uh, we can hook any cloud uh, your favorite cloud together, we cannot do, we cannot reach the accuracy of this animal. So obviously it makes sense to study this animal. And uh, this is a uh, much uh, more sophisticated uh, sonar. This has also a very sophisticated way to acquire the data. If we could uh, produce an ultrasound uh, with the resolution of the sonar of uh, dolphins, uh, we would probably be able to detect cancer and uh, fetal uh, problems much, much uh, earlier. So, of course, there's very strong incentive to study this animal. It's actually being studied quite a bit. So there's uh, a, a place where uh, these dolphins uh, swim with microphones attached to their head, with a GPS, with every possible thing you can think of. You see exactly the kind of signal that they send, and you record exactly the kind of uh, signal that they receive. So it's kind of a black box, and you try to uh, understand this black box. So uh, let's see if we can understand this black box with the help of uh, uh, signal processing. So uh, this Heisenberg uncertainty principle uh, basically says that you cannot localize 
in time and in space above a certain, uh, a certain coefficient, which kind of makes sense. Uh, I believe you'll agree with this. This is a simple example of that. So if uh, uh, the frequency f uh, is uh, the bandwidth of the frequency is zero, namely uh, there's, uh, it's a, a fixed frequency, of course you cannot localize in time. And when you increase uh, the bandwidth, uh, and of course a delta function uh, has an infinite bandwidth, then you can localize better and better in time. Okay. So uh, a series of um, several papers uh, that we did, uh, part of them with uh, Jim Simmons, uh, who is uh, one of the uh, most famous BATS uh, researchers at Brown University, revealed something very, very interesting. How much time do I have? Ten? Five? Oh, mine. Okay, so revealed something very interesting. Uh, this is the signal that the, uh, the BAT is sending. It's a chirp, so you see high frequency going to low frequency. When the BAT is analyzing that signal, uh, it's actually analyzing it in different bandwidths separately, okay? Uh, we know from Woodbird's theory from 1953 uh, that uh, the optimal match filter should be the exact uh, signal. So he's doing something that Woodward uh, and a few thousand other papers that were written after that uh, would say is wrong, okay? Because each expert by itself is actually producing much higher error because it's analyzing uh, part of the bandwidth. For those of you who are interested, it's kind of very easy to see what's going on. This is the cross-correlation function uh, uh, amplified to the, uh, to the top here. So uh, we see that higher frequency re produces smaller error. So basically when there's noise uh, in the y-axis, it translates into temporal noise or temporal uh, ability to estimate in the x-axis. So the sharper one, of course, produces a higher accuracy. And then when the noise uh, is such that it actually crosses to what's called the side lobes. This is called a coherent receiver. This is called a semi-coherent receiver. Then suddenly the noise jumps quite a bit because the side lobes uh, may be very far. And uh, then we see that the one that was very accurate here has the highest side lobes. Therefore, it's going to be more sensitive to noise. So this non-trivial uh, phenomena of uh, the cross-correlation function uh, kept uh, us uh, being puzzled. And if we want to uh, really see what's going on uh, about this uh, distribution of the error, uh, then it's the uh, furthest you can think of from Gaussian. It's basically a uniform distribution with a delta function. Therefore, when you try to do averaging or ensemble averaging of multiple experts, uh, you don't achieve anything. However, both uh, pretty much all sonar animals uh, perform this kind of multiple observations and averaging, okay? And to cut uh, the story uh, short, uh, we were able to show that by doing the exact uh, idea, by simulating the exact idea that the sonar bed is doing, namely analyzing with a single expert each bandwidth separately and then ensembling them together, we were able to show uh, that uh, basically we could uh, improve on what's called this Woodward equation, which kind of shows the following. So this is SNR and this is performance. So as SNR goes down, namely the signal, the noise becomes higher. Uh, there is this break uh, from uh, what's called the coherent receiver to the semi-coherent receiver, and then the error jumps uh, by a big factor. Okay, so the whole idea is to uh, push this part as far as possible to stay in a coherent receiver for as long as possible. We were able to show that this was possible when doing this bandwidth. I'm not going to get into it more. And the point was that we could actually then combine such uh, together to improve uh, the performance uh, based on the observations uh, from the bat. Let's move to another animal. This is the mole rat doing infrasound, living under the ground, banging its head in the tunnel and receiving uh, returns and deciding about its three-dimensional uh, uh, representation from that. Uh, what's 
very interesting about this, if you were asking yourself, well, this amazing performance of the bat is probably uh, as a result of millions of years of evolution, etc., etc. So this animal tells us the opposite. Sorry. So this uh, mole rat uh, is uh, uh, born where the eyes are connected to the visual cortex. And since it's living under the ground within about four months, uh, the eyes are getting disconnected from the visual cortex. And the auditor auditory cortex actually invades into the visual cortex. So we see that in the lifetime, in the very short early lifetime of this animal, it realizes that actually the eyes are not producing any stimulation and it's actually forming with the same network, with the same architecture, it's forming a totally different computational engine to, uh, uh, to actually calculate the three-dimensional. For those of you who are familiar with radar, uh, this uh, little uh, rat is actually doing what's called synthetic aperture. Uh, which we do with radars and we thought we invented it. No, this one does it, the bat is doing it, the dolphin doesn't need to do it. So what did we do here? Uh, let me quickly uh, jump into this and go into the technicalities. Again, we wanted to demonstrate uh, the same idea of, of multiple observations with uh, this uh, animal, but now the bandwidth is very, very low because this is infrasound. You cannot really break, you cannot really do uh, the trick that the bat is doing. And it turned out that if we uh, analyze the returning signal, not with the match filter, again, not with the single match filter, now we wanted to retain the bandwidth, so the only other parameter to change was the phase. So we are now analyzing uh, the returning signal with an array of unmatched filters changing uh, the phase. This really leads to a very interesting theory of biased uh, estimators. Again, it was about six papers to uh, nail it down uh, in, in various uh, uh, directions. The point is that now the uh, cross-correlation function has this non-symmetric side lobes and with machine learning, one can do something very interesting with this. So the bottom line was that we were able, again, to reduce uh, the error with this infrasound. We were able to reduce the error uh, by using this uh, array of experts, each one not optimal. So I believe if animals are doing it, uh, we have to go back and do it ourselves. Uh, everything that I was speaking uh, so far uh, can fit to uh, a shallow layer, single hidden uh, layer, or of course, multiple uh, hidden layer. Um, we uh, took it uh, to um, adding several factors, which I'm not going to get into. We were able to show that we were able to achieve a certain uh, accuracy with much reduced energy with an optimized number of pings. By the way, the dolphin sends about 200, between 60 to 200 pings in order to explore uh, a certain target. Uh, so this is a varying number of pings and we were able uh, to demonstrate that there is a, an algorithm to optimize uh, the number of pings. I'm soon running out of time, so let me just mention another colleague. Uh, why am I mentioning the elephant? So the elephant has seismic sensors in its legs uh, and it is able to uh, actually predict earthquakes. Okay, it's also communicating with other elephants. So if one elephant is in the forest and there's fire, uh, elephants about five kilometers away will start running, uh, getting away from the fire. So an amazing animal. And that reminds us that uh, the most in my mind at least, the most sophisticated signal processing was invented uh, in France in the 80s to analyze uh, seismic data. So seismic data is considered to be very, very difficult. And uh, uh, obviously these elephants uh, are uh, able to resolve it. I'll just touch upon two uh, things uh, that uh, has to do with it. Uh, again, I mentioned there was a guy here what is uh, so special about an orchestra for us? Again, a very, very difficult uh, signal processing task that we don't know how to solve, okay? So we can sit in an orchestra room 
we can hear with a single ear the whole orchestra, and then we can decompose in our brain the different instruments. We don't know how to do that in signal processing. Uh, we actually use what we call the color of, uh, of uh, the sound, the timber, and uh, we are very, very sophisticated uh, in uh, doing that. And this is something that I've been trying to do in the last uh, few years, both for uh, earthquakes and for EG data analysis. I'll just mention uh, one example here. So uh, this is the Fukushima earthquake that uh, occurred a few years ago. And uh, when I'm passing it through this machinery that has to do with uh, harmonic analysis and machine learning, I can find features that are indicative of abnormalities uh, that had to do with earthquake. Uh, in this Fukushima event, between 14 to 3 hours before, before the event, uh, there was an abnormality uh, that uh, indicated uh, a coming earthquake. It happened also in the aftershocks, and now this has become a big project uh, when we analyze uh, a lot of uh, different areas in the world to uh, determine where, uh, where we can predict and where we cannot predict uh, earthquakes. Um, so skipping the earthquakes, maybe I'll just say one word about uh, this. Uh, so, as you see here, there are a lot of microphones, and as I mentioned, we don't need uh, all these microphones when we analyze uh, the sound. <coughs> and the question is, do we need all these microphones when we try to analyze EEG? So EEG is actually an interesting signal, because the real seminal work done in EEG was done in 1924, using prehistorical signal processing tools. This guy, Hans Berger, uh, was able to show that there are certain frequencies that are associated with certain activities in the brain. And this work was so uh, uh, groundbreaking that people did not really try to see maybe there's something much more uh, that can be done. This is really what I'm doing these days. I'm trying to uh, uh, remove the need for something like this and actually uh, analyze the brain just with one ear, as I mentioned, or with two electrodes, as is here, based on these uh, principles that I mentioned. So I'm not going to go into this. Uh, we were talking about uh, advanced signal processing, and this uh, was mentioned yesterday. There was this panel a year ago in the Technion with uh, the two uh, top uh, people in signal processing, Rafi Koifman from Yale and Stefan Mala, uh, and uh, several people, uh, Amnon Shashua uh, and, and others uh, that are uh, more familiar with uh, deep uh, learning. And uh, first of all, I certainly recommend to uh, watch this. Uh, it was very interesting. And, but maybe I'll highlight two things before I uh, finish. Uh, basically, uh, Rafi Koifman, uh, who is pretty much the authority to say that, said that this uh, imposing structure that has to do with harmonic uh, structure uh, is very, very difficult, and he basically does not believe it's going to be uh, easy to do in the next several years with uh, deep uh, networks, um, like even modeling uh, the reverberations that are occurring in this room right now when I speak uh, is a very sophisticated uh, task that relies on a lot of uh, structure. And Stefan Mala, who start started looking into deep uh, architectures, uh, basically said that fast Fourier transform or even wave wheel packet analysis are all deep kind of architectures. They have, you can uh, present them as layers uh, of uh, convolutional networks. And so uh, the only difference is basically how you impose the weights in those uh, uh, units, and that's an interesting uh, approach. So let me uh, summarize by uh, saying that uh, signal processing theory tells us that a uh, single expert is not optimal. I hope I was able to persuade you with that. Uh, training for invariance can actually go a long way, and uh, one can do uh, a lot more with it. And uh, advances in brain research will improve AI. There's no doubt in that. 
And my hope is that advances in AI and signal processing will improve the way we uh, research the brain. Thank you very much.